Welcome to Canada's podcast, the number one podcast for entrepreneurs by entrepreneurs. All right, Scott. Welcome to Canada's podcast. It's great to meet you. And, um, you know, for for those that, that don't know you, you have a, you know, a pretty accomplished background in, in the in investment and media business in Canada. Um, but rather than me explain it, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself uh, and what you're doing today? Well, Philip, thank you very much for having me on your podcast show. Um, I have had uh, some great successes, but I've also got a lot of scars on my back, Philip. <laughs> you know, my career, I, uh, I'm 56 now, so I uh, kind of think of my career in, in two pieces. The first part was largely the formal part of the investment world where I started as a stockbroker, loved doing that. I love cold calling people, believe it or not. It's uh, not something a lot of people would say, but I just love the the, yeah. the thrill of victory, so to speak, when you <laughs> were able to get through to somebody yeah. in business with them. Got into investment banking and meaning uh, helping companies raise uh, money and, um, and loved uh, technology companies. Um, you know, today it seems kind of obvious because virtually every company embraces technology in some format. But I'm talking about in the late 80s and early 90s. Uh, well, clearly there was, you know, Silicon Valley and what was happening in technology. It was less obvious that uh, the investment world would be dominated by technology themes. Yeah, and, I, grew, I grew up in that world too, at the same time. Exactly. And um, so I, uh, I started uh, focusing on focus, uh, focusing on, pardon me, um, financing technology companies and uh, really enjoyed that. I just loved uh, being exposed to entrepreneurs who had a vision for the future and were often prepared to risk, you know, their whole net worth or, or forego salary for years, all the kind of things that you have to do as an entrepreneur and uh, focused on that and did quite well. And then I ended up building a, um, a brokerage firm in the mid nineties, which became the number one uh, technology investment bank in Canada. And so my first half of my career was kind of defined by the formal structure of the industry. Mm -hmm. the last half, really more informal where, you know, for lack of a better words, I'm in the venture capital business or the entrepreneurial business. Really, I would describe myself as, uh, you know, a technology uh, venture capitalist focused on two themes in technology, uh, financial services or what everybody's calling fintech these days. Yeah on the media side of things. And media has increasingly been overlapped uh, with technology. But those are my two loves and where in some elements of them, I think I've got a reasonable degree of expertise. Mm -hmm. that's, that's really interesting. Um, would you call yourself an entrepreneur? Oh, 100%. Yeah, yeah. No, you, uh, risk it? you risk it, do you? I risk it way too much. Especially <laughs> funny, you know, when I was younger, uh, I was pretty cavalier about money in the sense that, well, I can always make it back, always make it back and get a little older. And, and now I've got a, a bucket full of kids. I have eight kids, Philip. I just had my latest kid five months ago. Okay. Wow. That's so three, amazing. Three different moms, mind you. It's a bit of a science experiment. Yeah. Uh, they keep me busy. And that's for sure. But I, I think a little bit more about, risk. And when you get older, you tend to be less willing and eager to, to kind of do the unexpected or try the more creative or be more aggressive because it tends to be, uh, tends to be the, the element of youth that allows you to get away with some of these things. When you're a little older, people go, what the heck is that guy uh, doing that from? So I notice it a little bit and it forces me to say, don't lose that capacity for risk. And I'm talking measured risk, hopefully. Yeah. Uh, but I'm a big believer, you know, you got to be in the arena. Uh, the, the famous Theodore Roosevelt speech of 1909 in Paris about the man in the arena, I would say that defines really my life in many respects. Yeah, so, you know, I interview so many entrepreneurs who are kind of moving through that, that you know, emerging state, uh, meeting people like you on the VC side of things, you know, is there anything, I mean, it would, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you, because you've got a ton of knowledge on that front. You know, 
their challenge is obviously to get themselves financed. Is there any kind of wisdom that you can pass from the, the investor side of it to them? Uh, that that you know, obviously there's there's a, a slew of it, but any one or two gems that that that, that they 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 should keep kind of in their mind all the time. Well, I don't know if this will answer it, but I've long felt that there are four ingredients to outsized success. And I use the word outside, outsized success to be differentiated from conventional success. And what I mean by that is you can pick any vocation in the world. And if you work hard, because I think hard work is the base ingredient, if you work hard, you'll be a success at it. But if you want outsized success, you need to be, yeah, you need to have four things that take place. One, you have to have a vision that is truly predicting the future to be different than it is today. And the second thing is you need to attract a half a dozen A players that share that vision. And they're usually in different disciplines. One might be sales, one might be marketing, one might be operations. Right. Right. Share, wow, we, we get that. Um, as with respect to this uh, predicting of the future. I say half a dozen very purposely. It might be five, it might be seven, it can't be two. That's too thin. So in other okay. words, okay. you've got a couple A players, you can't get there. And if you've got 20, it might sound odd, but I don't think you can make it either. There's too many prima donnas in the room. <laughs> and the third thing is to be slightly ahead of your time. It's probably the most important of all of them. There's, I could give you, and we could spend hours talking about people who've thought of things, invented things uh, well before the world was commercially ready for them. And they didn't get the benefit either from a financial reward or personal reward. Mm -hmm. I've got some of those. I've done, done that in my earlier life. <laughs> right. and, and at the time, it feels like it's going to happen instantly because yeah. you predicted the future. And often they'll even get the half a dozen people. But if you're too early, you know, it can be a sad story. You run out of money or you just lose the the desire to stick in there. If you're too late, forget it. Uh, so you've got to be slightly ahead of your time. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the fourth one is luck, good old fashioned luck. But just back to the third one for one more second. You know, people laugh about hockey sticks, uh, the proverbial term for the business plan. And you see the projection and it looks like a hockey stick. We're going to do this, this and this, and then it's going to take off. Those are actually true in my view. They're true about people's careers and they're true about businesses. And what's happening when you're on the blade of the stick that could be three years or 10 years as a person or a business, you're building the core competency. You're building day after day, whether that's 10,000 hours, they talk about playing the guitar or whatever your vocation mm -hmm. is. It's a similar theme. You're building that core capability. And the moment the world's really ready for what you predicted, it goes like this. It looks like an overnight success. It looks like a hockey stick, but it's really that you are uniquely positioned to take advantage of that. Yeah. So you've met some unexpected challenges in, 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 in your sort of business life. You know, do you have a, have you developed a particular way to handle them? A pro, you know, so you meet this thing, which is a wall. Is, have you discovered that? There are ways, if you follow certain processes, you can move around them. You know, uh, it's a great question because I, <laughs> I, um, you know, even today, obviously, COVID's caused a, a few challenges in some things uh, I'm involved in. And, and, and one in particular, which I know we'll get a chance to talk about Future Vault that I'm spending the vast, vast majority of my time on having a lot of fun with, mm -hmm. you know, we'll take two steps forward and then there'll be a step back, you know, some client or prospective client for whatever reason doesn't uh, turn into one. And there, there was those moments of demoralization. Uh, and I think that's probably the key character trait that defines someone's temperament and ability to succeed in the long term as an entrepreneur. Look, some people are very lucky and it happens right out of the gate. Doesn't mean they didn't deserve it because their hard work and the vision and the six people and the slightly ahead of your time. But the vast majority of people have to do the blade of the hockey stick. They've got to spend years and years and years and years before whatever their original idea or something that's more from that idea becomes reality. And that requires resilience. 
So I would say if you said to me, you know, of all the character traits that matter the most to succeed in entrepreneurship and what do you do when you got turned down, when you didn't get the money, when all those kind of things, it's the resilience. And I say to all my kids, uh, you know, if dad gets hit by a bus tomorrow, uh, you got to remember one thing. You fall off that horse, you get right back on the horse. And I find myself having to kind of look in the mirror once in a while on a failure, a small failure, a medium failure, or a big failure and say, listen to the advice you give your kids, take a deep breath, have a nice sleep, but get up tomorrow and, and go back at it again. On the advice side of it, um, a question I ask everyone, because I think it's really important. What's the best piece of advice that you've ever received? That, that, you know, those real, that real important thing that you've used through, through, you know, through, your, through your career kind of thing? Well, it probably um, was indirectly from my grandmother. And the thesis was, it tied in a bit to some of the things we've already talked about, but that there's, there's three layers to achieving great success. And, and it starts at a base level of hard work. If you're not prepared to work hard, I'm sure you can get lucky, but 99% of the world just simply needs to work hard. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean not working smartly. And I probably could work a lot more smartly, but working hard is going to achieve a level of success. The next thing is, is initiative. You have the initiative to come up with new ideas, new thoughts. You've got a great idea, but are you going to actually then work hard associated with that initiative? And the third piece she would say would be uh, guts, uh, but they have to be in that order, Philip, mm -hmm. uh, in the sense that guts is, you know, let's go to Las Vegas and take our life savings and put it all on red on the roulette table. That's crazy. Uh, of course, you're risking everything. So that's not very smart initiative. We both know, you know, many, many people who've come up with great ideas. They start the initiative, but they don't, they give up. They either lose the resilience or they lose the hard work piece of the puzzle. Uh, so it's got to be in that order, hard work, initiative, and then you sprinkle in a little bit of guts and that's when it can really uh, work out for you. Interesting. Very interesting. Okay. I'm going to ask you some, what I term rapid fire questions, uh, kind of don't think about them too much. Just kind of spit out the answer. Oh, here we go. <laughs> if you weren't doing what you were doing now, what would you be doing instead? Oh, my God. Um, well, I, I want to say a water ski instructor because it's my favorite, oh, yeah. favorite sport. But, uh, you know, when I was really young, when I was 14, my, uh, my grandmother, the same one I referred to earlier, she changed my life because she, for my birthday, gave me five shares of Abitibi paper. And uh, you would remember Abitibi paper uh, from way back when. I looked out the window. All my buddies had bikes, little bikes for their birthday presents. And I was thinking, oh, I kind of wish I had a bike, but she gave me this share certificate worth $65. But I, I learned, wow, you can use your brain and, and try to uh, make a living uh, from doing that and understanding the stock market and companies, how they work and how capital is raised, and how jobs are created, uh, et cetera. So I guess the reason I tell you that story is, you know, would I love to, you know, water ski all day long? Uh, and I love playing squash and tennis and a whole bunch of other sports. But the truth is, I love the investment business and I love the machinations of it. And I love how it intertwines with financial services and media, the two areas of my focus. So I don't know if I could do anything else. Yeah, from I, know, I know exactly what you're saying. I appreciate so that. On, on another, what, what book are you currently reading or listening to uh, or, or would rec and or would recommend to the, well, to the audience? It, it, you know, if you you would laugh if you looked at my um, uh, at my bedside table at home because there's about forty books on it, and they're all about twenty five pages into them. And I I've, I've actually decided what I've started to do is read the New York Times. And that, that didn't work. We got to turn this sound thing off somehow. But the New York Times Sunday Book Review, because they've got about six or seven book reviews. And you can read it and you've obsessively got the crux of the book. But what I, what I do enjoy, and I'm reading a Nelson DeMille uh, fiction, and I can't even tell you what the name of it is, which is pretty embarrassing, but I love Nelson DeMille, one of my longer term uh, favorite fiction writers. If I want to go to sleep on whatever, I'm burnt out a Saturday afternoon, a Sunday, whatever it may be, I will turn on or I'll, I'll read a Nelson DeMille book. 
and it will uh, it will put me to sleep. If I'm reading nonfiction, uh, then it's a lot harder uh, to do that because I feel like I've got to retain the information. Okay. Are you a morning or a night person? Well, I'm becoming both. I'm a, a night person by instinct and innately. Um, my team and I and people I work with kind of kid me because I will regularly email them at two in the morning. Um, but, you know, I've got all these young kids, so I'm up pretty early as well. Uh, but I, I much prefer getting into a groove from kind of 11 o'clock till 2 a.m. and getting a bunch of stuff done. But I have to be 24-7 now uh, with all my responsibilities. What's keeping you up at night these days? You know, the nature of the beast in the world I'm in, which is uh, financing and, and leading, typically as chairman of the board. So, you know, and, and an executive chairman, meaning a very active chairman, not kind of a governance pure right. role, you know, in the meat of trying to get new customers and recruiting people and all that kind of stuff, which I enjoy. Uh, by definition, it takes years for these companies to be uh, cash positive. And by definition, if you don't want to dilute the heck out of yourself out of the gate, you need to finance and lock step. So you raise some money, you, you make some improvements, you hopefully can justify an increase in, in valuation. And But there are moments when if you go into a window in which it's uh, you know more challenging to raise money, uh, those are the moments that you have some GI. And you're not trying to be too aggressive on that front in terms of you know waiting to the last second. Uh, but but that's, that's kind of what wakes me up. And also, you just constantly question yourself. You know, this was our vision. This was our view. Um, it feel, felt yesterday like it was working. Today, maybe it didn't in the afternoon as you didn't get a new customer you hoped you would. Uh, do you have it right? And so it brings on, uh, it brings on a degree of, of anxiety, a degree of fear. Uh, but it's also exciting because you want to, at least in my case, I want to prove to myself uh, that we can do it and we can we can deliver what we said we would to people around our prediction of the future. So if you had to pick one word to describe yourself, what would it be and why choose that word? Uh, gosh, I was going to make a joke. If I knew who was watching and they're all my buddies, I'd kind of make a joke. But uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, I, um, I, I might go back to the resilient thing. I, you know, I, on a couple of things that haven't worked in business and life. Uh, I remember in one case, I, we got involved and there was a really nasty uh, counterparty and some fraud involved and all this crazy stuff. It was in the U S and uh, a couple of the investors at the end, uh, when I called them up on a new opportunity uh, said, we're absolutely going to back you. You know, you stuck with that. You, you didn't miss a beat. You didn't get any money. You worked on it for a year. We actually got 80 cents on the dollar back. Uh, in this particular thing where we would have got zero. Mm. Uh, but when I ask other people for money, it's more important than my money. I mean, obviously I want to do well, but if you give me money to invest, you're backing me personally. And usually with limited due diligence, because you're, you're counting on me to have, uh, to, to have really, you know, considered what we're doing and put in place all the building blocks that give the opportunity, the best chance to succeed. I'm a big believer in governance and independent boards and audited financial statements and kind of all the stuff that investors deserve. I think it makes a company uh, a much stronger company, but at the end of the day, most of the people that have backed me do so because they, they trust my judgment. Uh, there's a relationship and I take that uh, to heart and I take that very seriously and when the chips are down the point about what wakes you up at night it's less about me thinking about me losing money and it's much more about me thinking about losing these other people money and it's very motivating uh, therefore to work hard and do my best uh, to get out of whatever problem if there's a problem or to continue to succeed if, if things are going really well so I, I have to ask this at the moment so what's your perspective I'm not going to use the term new normal on on a new future. What does it look like for Scott Patterson? Well, do you mean like with respect with to COVID and uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I, uh, I think I've been predicting for some time that we were going to experience a sharp V recovery. Um, I'm a little bit surprised by the veracity of this second wave. Uh, but my prediction, you know, I was asking people a few months ago, I had two questions at kind of every, either every Zoom call or uh, when we could have a little bit of dinner 
parties socially distanced appropriately up north and things like that. Mm -hmm. I would say, you know, who's the next president and are we talking about COVID in the summer of 2021? And my view was Biden will win. I still have that view. And I don't think we're talking about COVID next summer. I mean, other than remember last summer, do you remember how crazy it was? And I know that's only nine months from now, but um, I, I think we're probably at the peak of the, I don't know if fear is the right word. The fear peak was probably back in, you know, at the very, you know, mid-March when things got really scary and it was unknown. But I, my sense is we're at the peak of the sense that, hey, it's going to spin out of control. And I'm not a medical doctor. I know nothing about the science. My sense is, though, when things are front page, it's not sustainable to have the same story on the front page for long periods of time. And I think it comes off the front page and it is a if it's there, it's a fact of life. And fortunately, it looks like the mortality rates are declining. And, you know, the people that do need the right protection and care are, are taking care of themselves and hopefully by governments and communities, et cetera. But I, I think uh, I, I think this is old news. It doesn't mean that uh, things aren't going to change with respect to Zoom calls and with respect to DocuSign and respect to Future Vault, the company I mentioned earlier around how rapidly some of these technologies are going to be deployed. I, I think there's some things that aren't going to change. I mean, uh, if you look at overhead and various other things, there's some new ways of doing business that were there, but have accelerated dramatically and are really not going to change. It, you know, um, so... I don't think I'd like to have stock in Canada or any of those guys at the moment, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, that's about it. I think that was really interesting. Some really good perspectives uh, from a little different angle in terms of uh, we don't get too many of you know the, the venture guys on, and 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 uh, I think it's it's very interesting. Um, how can people? You know, lots of people listen and and. There's a fair amount of interest. How can people get a hold of you? You know, they, they hear this, they want to do something. Can they email you? Is there some? Yeah, sure. On, uh, on, online, they can get a hold of you. I, uh, I, um, over the years, people have uh, said uh, that it's been kind of a, you know, a good policy to be kind of open. I love meeting new people. I am very busy, but you know yeah. what? Uh, there's a lot of great people out there with great ideas and and or feedback. Uh, for me, so you know, my uh, my email is probably the easiest. Uh, Phillips, it's 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 S Patterson one T in Patterson, the Scottish yeah. uh, right? yep. Yep. S Patterson at PattersonPartners dot com, and uh, we'd love to hear from from anybody. Okay, Scott. Well, it's, listen, it's been great meeting you. I really enjoyed it, and uh, thanks for coming on Canada's podcast. Really appreciate it. Well, I appreciate it too, Philip. Thanks. You have a great uh, great rest of your day. <laughs>